Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a good lunch. I hope not too good a lunch, because, um, well, you know, you mustn't miss this thought-provoking session that we're going to have with our uh, two distinguished panellists. Um, just just uh, an admin reminder, we have the QR code over there. Uh, that's for our questions for Pigeonhole later, but later on we can also use the mics because we're, we'll be quite informal to, today. So I'll, I'll just get a bit into our introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, you know, today we are very fortunate to have these two leaders from, you know, the global maritime firms to, to share their views on our topic of sustainability. Um, I'm not sure if they really need that much, you know, by way of introduction, but perhaps given today's theme of sustainability, let me talk a bit of what they have been doing on the sustainability front, and then I'll let them get, get into the details. So, Andreas, as chairman of BW Group, He's already very much involved in looking at sustainable technologies in the renewable space. His group has investments in areas such as solar, wind, batteries, biofuels and water treatment. Um, one other thing, he's also instrumental in really driving Singapore's maritime decarbonisation efforts. He's the chairman of the Global Centre for Maritime Decarbonisation. And actually, with 70% of our global transshipments going through Singapore, you know, this centre is able to work very closely with private and public sector partners across the supply chain. Um, this will shape standards for future fuels, finance first of a kind projects, and pilot low carbon solutions. So I look forward later to hearing how BW Group is expanding in this alternative energy space, how businesses can work with the public sector to achieve better outcomes. And if I may turn to Mr. Shao, he's the fourth generation family business steward of IMC Group. He has committed his shipping conglomerate and business group towards the creation of the new era of well-being and happiness. Um, so it will be interesting to hear his views. He has very interesting views, I must tell you, on sustainability. He chairs the Council of Wisdom for Family Business Network International, which is about how family businesses can transform the economy towards one that is based on ethics and well-being. So he recently authored this book, One Choice, One World, Rise of the Well-Being and Happiness Economy, where he presents a worldview that encompasses ancient wisdom and modern science. So really all this ties in very well with our theme today of sustainability and generating growth. So today what we hope to achieve, we want to discuss um, where we are now, what are the strategies, what are the responses that global businesses like them are taking, and how should we plan ahead to navigate this agenda and how should we drive growth. So I, I better stop talking and talk for too long. Um, the panellists each will take uh, about 15 minutes, I'm not sure, they may take longer and they will tell us how they got started, how they're making, how they're progressing on this sustainability journey, um, you know, their overall vision for their businesses. Then we will open the, the floor to questions. So perhaps if I could invite Andreas to have a go first. Thank you very much, Sushan, for the kind introduction. Well, there are sexier industries than shipping, like technology and aviation and so on, but we're very pleased to be carrying 90% of world trade and to have a big impact on Singapore and the world economy. We also have a big impact on sustainability, and it was good to see Apple this week talking about how it's 95% more environmentally friendly to ship iPhones by sea than by air. What can we learn from shipping as a hard-to-abate sector? Let me share three ideas in my opening remarks which have broad applicability beyond shipping. The first is that aspirations are important, but we have to be careful not to let our ambitions become detached from reality. And I'll explain more in a moment what I mean. The second is that governments have a critical role to play in stimulating a market response, but will need to be careful to avoid overreaching. And the third theme is that collaboration is necessary, but collaboration is hard. 
What do I mean when I say we need aspirations, but these mustn't become detached from reality? There's been a lot of focus on target setting recently, and this year we had a robust debate in the International Maritime Organization, um, which led to an increase in the emissions target for the shipping industry. By 2030, we will now have to reduce total GHG emissions by 20 to 30 percent compared to 2008. By 2040, it will have to be 70 to 80 percent, and by 2050, 100 percent. 2040 and 50 are still quite far away, but if we look at 2030, I have my doubts that target is achievable, and let me explain why. To get this level of reduction while the global fleet is growing, you need zero carbon fuels. There are only three options on the table. Biofuels, methanol, and ammonia. For biofuels, there simply isn't enough, and we're going to be competing with other industries that need it, like airlines. For methanol, we would need 7,000 terawatt hours of renewable electricity to produce enough hydrogen, even more with fleet growth. 7,000 terawatt hours is twice the current production globally from solar and wind. And because methanol has a carbon atom in it, you release CO2 when it's burnt. So this only works if you can make methanol with CO2 that has already been captured, for instance, from biogenic sources. 900 million tons of biomass is what we need. Or there's ammonia, the third option I mentioned, where there are no engines in existence yet, and where we need to build ships and fueling infrastructure and safety protocols. Like methanol, ammonia also needs hydrogen from renewable power. Uh, here we have the option of blue ammonia. Instead of green ammonia, you can have blue ammonia, which is uh, natural gas um, and with carbon capture. So you use natural gas, but you, you mitigate the CO2 with carbon capture. But we're unlikely to see many ships sailing on ammonia before 2030. The world fleet is 60,000 ships, and we currently have 300 ships on order with clean fuels. And if you want a new ship today, you're really talking about 27, 28, so 2030 is just around the corner. Let me put this all another way. The shipping industry today consumes 2.5% of the world's fuel. To meet current emissions targets in 2030, we will need up to 40% of all available green fuel. To get to zero, we will need all the renewable energy in the world. And the fuel will cost three to six times what it costs now. Now, I know that saying these things sounds a bit pessimistic and puts me at risk of being branded a climate change denier. Let me be clear. I believe in climate change. I chair the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, and we co-funded the center, so we're putting our money behind transition. I want transition to happen. I'm actually quite optimistic that we will find solutions over time, but I want to be honest about it. Let's remember Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist Richard Feynman, who said, Reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. We can fool ourselves, but nature cannot be fooled. One last point on this. Stretch goals are good, but the problem with stretching too far is that people will stop following at some point because the, uh, the aspirations become divorced from reality and from their real-world needs. So if Northern Europe becomes too evangelistic, uh, the Global South may stop listening. We will also create an energy crisis because false promises lead to massive underinvestment in critical infrastructure. That's a case of turning a long-term climate crisis into a near-term humanitarian crisis from energy poverty. 
So let's have targets, but keep reality in mind as we set them. My second point. Governments have a critical role to play in stimulating a market response, but have to guard against overreaching. There are a lot of good things that government can do to push transition. The IRA in the US provided about $300 billion of government incentives that is unleashing trillions of dollars of investment, and Europe is now trying to follow. The really astonishing statistics come from China. And Fred is a China expert, so we can talk about this afterwards. Um, People point out that China has been at. 那当然，我知道在中国呢，他们也目前也非常的推崇这一方面的工作，就是在应对这个环境变化的一个问题，而且尤其是在软料方面的一些应对。那另外呢，就是在中国呢，他们也用了。Decade, 270 gigawatts of wind power, compared to the U.S. at 90 gigawatts. And the European leader UK at 18 gigawatts, 270 versus 90 in the US versus 18 in the UK. In 2022, the US spent 141 billion dollars on clean energy. The EU spent 180 billion dollars, and China spent 546 billion dollars. As you all know, China produces 80% of the world's solar panels, 90% of the world's permanent magnets used for wind turbines, 75% of the world's battery cell capacity, 87% of rare earths processing, which you need for the green transition, and so on. This has all been helped by the Chinese government making clear to the private sector what are the strategic priorities. I don't know how much they provided in direct subsidies, so that's a gap in my my understanding. But market sources seem to have done forces seem to have done a lot、um, of the work with provinces and companies competing with each other. The private sector has created global champions like CATL in batteries, SunGrow in inverters, Longyi in solar panels, BYD in electric vehicles. When one hears of a European country. Giving 10 billion euros in direct incentives to a single chip maker, one has to question whether this is a case of overreach. The state of New York spent one billion dollars on a solar panel factory, which Tesla pays one dollar per year to rent, and which is estimated to return only 54 cents for each dollar invested. Is that what governments should be doing? Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, how two parties. Will exchange freely with each other when it is to their mutual benefit. If government intervenes so dramatically, at what point does it undermine free trade? So, just to give you a statistic, it's estimated there were about 9,000 protectionist measures in place worldwide a decade ago. Now it's 35,000. So protectionism has shot up dramatically. There used to be a supply response when shipping rates or oil prices went up. People would rush to order tankers, or they would increase oil production. Nowadays, the market fails to respond because of social and regulatory forces standing in the way. Our tanker business is earning 50% return on equity. I mean, the banks are earning 10, you know, 12 if they're doing well. We're earning 50% return on equity, and nobody's ordering tankers. Why? Because society and governments are saying. Don't touch it. It's oil. Don't don't do oil. So my last sort of thought on this segment. My last segment is shorter,、um, but my my last thought is where can governments play this key role without stopping markets from functioning? One is putting a price on things which have a social cost, like CO2. In shipping, many of us would actually be happy to see a carbon levy on the fuel we consume, and this would be especially powerful because we have a Mechanism for applying this regulation globally, which is called the International Maritime Organization, so we can create a level playing field. A second thing governments can do is play a bigger role in public infrastructure to help the transition. And for this transition, that means the electrical grid above all. Let me share with you some amazing statistics about this. The West. Is deeply underinvested in the grid. 
If you look at high voltage DC lines, which are very efficient for transmitting electricity over long distances, Germany has 220 kilometers of HVDC, high voltage DC lines. Then uh, UK has 300 kilometers. Denmark has 2,000 kilometers, which is better. That's maybe not so critical, by the way, for shorter distances if you're looking within countries in Europe. But even the US has only 2,400 kilometers of HVDC. What about China and India? China, the US has 2,400. China has 48,000 kilometers and is building another 66,000 kilometers by 2025. So that's over 100,000 kilometers by 2025 compared to 2,400 in the US. India has 19,000 currently and is building 165,000 kilometers by 2026. That's 40 to 80 orders of magnitude greater than the US. Without an upgraded grid, whether we're talking about local or long distance lines, it's going to be very hard to move all the green electrons. Our company has a solar business in the US, and I can tell you from first-hand experience that the interconnection queues are getting longer and longer. In New York, the queue is now 1,900% of capacity, and is taking up to four years from application to commissioning. Solar projects entering the queue have an average completion rate of 10% across the US, and Europe is not much better. My last point about government involvement is that it's critical to maintain some regulatory stability and visibility. Whether we impose penalties on CO2 or give incentives for decarbonization, we need to know what the price is going to be so that we can model our investments with confidence that they're going to pay back. It's great to see the language about stable policy becoming more prevalent in many countries. So in sum on this point, the private sector delivers great outcomes but government can help with price signals, with public infrastructure, and with stable policy. Okay, my last point. Um, collaboration is necessary, but collaboration is hard. Everyone knows that collaboration is critical for decarbonization. It's actually a bit of a cliche. Uh, we hear it all the time, but how does it happen in reality? Two years ago, we set up the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, or GCMD, as we call it, here in Singapore. In the span of two years, we raised about $200 million from 17 core partners, including BW, BHP, BP, Chevron, NYK, c and others. We have another 10 coalition and knowledge partners, and we have over 80 project partners. MPA provides funding support for initiatives in Singapore. GCMD has really put itself on the map for decarbonization because it is a credible place for people to work on solutions together. We're not a think tank, we are a do tank. Uh, in other words, we are about pilots with real infrastructure and trials, not just research reports. Piloting solutions has a cost, so GCMD enables companies to spread the cost and the risk. What are we doing? We're testing biofuels to see which grades work best. We test synthetic, we place synthetic DNA traces in the supply chain, so we follow the clean molecule. If you're going to pay a premium for a clean molecule, you want to know after it's been blended and gets to you that you're paying for the real thing. We're preparing trials with ammonia to see if we can do safe refueling. We're testing carbon capture on board ships to see if it's a feasible pathway. We share the learning so that smaller companies which can't afford to pay for it can learn from it too. So why do I say collaboration is hard? Because in the first place, it's hard to collaborate without institutions like GCMD bringing parties together and sharing cost and risk. It's hard if one is not science-based, because everyone has opinions and emotions and corporate self-interest. So for this reason, we assemble the team of engineers and scientists in our center. And collaboration is hard because tackling something as big as climate change needs the public and private sectors to work together. The private sector depends on regulatory support and the public sector needs corporate agility and creativity. 
when you combine two parties with different agendas, different speed, and different risk appetite, that takes work. If we can get this public-private collaboration right, there's so much Singapore can do to take a global lead. This is the biggest fueling or bunkering port in the world. We can develop global safety regulations in the field of new fuels. We can establish a hub for trading and certification of biofuels. We can act as a focal point for carbon levies or trading. We can be a center for digital solutions and data mining. And although we don't have places to sink CO2, we can help to establish frameworks for CCS in the region, uh, or at least technologies. As a final reflection on my earlier point about government involvement, Singapore has always been very careful not to overdo subsidies, nor to pick winners. So where the public sector can work effectively with the private sector, it is by supporting infrastructure and institutions that will underpin transition. I'm going to give the last word to Adam Smith here. I said earlier that he was against governments interfering in private markets. But he would have approved of support for institutions like GCMD and for public works like fueling infrastructure. He said, the sovereign has only three duties to attend to. First, the duty of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent societies. Second, the duty of protecting as far as possible every member of the society from the injustice or oppression of every other member of it. And thirdly, the duty of erecting and maintaining certain public works and institutions, which it can never be for the interest of any individual or small number of individuals to erect and maintain, because the profit could never repay the expense to the small number of individuals, though it may do much more than repay it to society. I'll end my opening remarks here. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. I think you covered quite a fair bit of ground. <laughs> um, so, but without further ado, may I invite uh, Chairman Sao to uh, give us a bit more of an uplifting view about sustainability. Am I right? <laughs> yes, before we were had a little chat with Andrea, I said, look, he said, I will challenge you. We should have a good debate. You know? So yeah, we're gonna walk up there like rock star and give a good show. Okay, um, so I've been thinking, you know, there's so many points he said, I agreed. So I had to say, well, how do I put on this show? I said, well, first uplift, and I agree with him. It's difficult to collaborate in this era. And yet, if you examine carefully, human being does not have big claws or big teeth or, can climb trees or fly in the sky or run very fast or dive deep in the water. And yet, we're the king of animals. We have submarine that goes deeper, planes that get fly. In fact, we have rocket that flies outside. Human success is based on collaboration. Mm. It's not uh, um, Darwino, Darwinian. Survival of the fittest, competition. Yet competition has a role to play because competition <clears throat> creates challenges and only through overcoming this challenge you evolve. So the new biological evolutionary viewpoint, evolution has some nature. Number one, those who can collaborate with environment will flourish. Number two, the area of evolution is always towards challenge. And the third, it's always integrating to a better structure and sophistication and complexity. Okay. And so human being is made of 50 trillion cells of many more bacteria and you know, virus. And you'll be surprised to hear it is what the bacteria and virus want that our cell will evolve. Okay. You think you want to evolve? You decide? No, it's your bacteria decide how you're going to evolve. So, surprise, a lot of surprise. Hmm. 
human being who study science, we believe how it came on science. The study of truth through matters found out there is no matter. Just vibrating of energy clustering together. That everything is created from this unified theory because we found 17 electrical magnetic field all spreading up energy but yet super synchronized reality of nature we see is incredible so they come up with a unified field theory the field of consciousness and there too they talk about energy because they are the real truth this is only an appearance and this appearance cannot be truth because in the material world everything is changing the only observable constant is change mm. right yeah. so this is gonna really throw you in a different direction because not many of you are deep into study quantum science what is quantum entanglement quantum mechanics so we have a new thing that's going on and we have a new understanding that we progress by collaboration. Okay. If we collaborate, we create. If we fail to collaborate, we destroy, we fight, we go to war. Now what you see? War among nature, the geopolitics we talked about, is one of the biggest risks. Everybody's worried about a Sino-American Sino relationship, how it's going to unfold. In Singapore, for sure. <laughs> right in the middle of standing on two boats, one leg each. Do not want to split up and die. Oh, well, let's not go there first. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We should go back <laughs> that will to leave sustain. That. Yeah, we'll, we'll today, leave that too. <laughs> the topic is, as I understand, yes. driving sustainable <laughs> growth. So we have to understand what's driving. <laughs> what's sustainability and what's growth? Number one, we are driven by two forces. The force of love and the force of fear. Now fear has many faces. Love has many faces. They're to drive. This is the yin and yang of the material world. Our driving is either by love or by fear. Then you look at sustainability. And what is sustainability? What is well-being? United Nations talk about the well-being and happiness economy, which everybody we want, well-being and happiness. And they said that we need a new paradigm economics. We have to move from GDP to GNH. So how would GNH drive growth mm. and sustainability? Now, well-being in scientific is coherency. Very simple. If you're coherent, you don't live in the past, you don't live in the future, you don't live in fear, you become just you. Wow, you are at least 95% of your sickness. But scientists already know that 95% of our sickness come from stress. Not a 5%, I don't know, maybe karma. Anyway, DNA. Huh? But 95% due to stress. So you cannot be well. Based on your lifestyle, the toxicity of earth, the food that you eat. Have you seen how, we, how the animals are treated that we grow to cause consumption? If you go there, you probably don't want to eat it. Because if you eat that fearful, suffering animal, you become fearful, suffering person. In your chemistry. Energy. You're eating that energy. So your body is stressed, you work very hard, your body is stressed, you think too much, your body is stressed, you worry too much, your body is stressed, oh, you got sick. You're not coherent with yourself. So sustainability, whether you call this the green economy, whether you call it a well-being happiness economy, where you call it the good economy, as the China has now labeled it, it's all the same direction of moving a new era, I call new era of well-being and happiness. Because that's all what we want. But we don't know. So, oh, make more money, we're happier? No, no, no. Make more money, you're not necessarily happier. But you're yeah. fearful. Oh, no, not having money, I'm not happy. 
So you're trapped into the rat race. <clears throat> so what would this new economy look like? This green well-being and happiness, this good economy, whatever you want to call it, it's a new economy. A new economy that really we just want to be well. And wellness is coherency. So if you're coherent with your family, ah, you get joy and happiness and love. If you're coherent in mankind, you have fantastic collaboration and creativity. Mm -hmm. So, yes, this is a very bad time. We're in cycles. If we sit back and really look, how do we get here? Mm -hmm. How do we get here? It's cycles. Energy is cycles. So we went, if you look at the Western paradigm, we all came from a shamanic era where we want to find coherency with nature, to religious where we run by belief systems, which, you know, they create some problem with religion because you believe, and I don't believe, you believe different. Then you have the late enlightenment. First, you have the revolution through arts called Renaissance, which is a spiritual activity. Mm -hmm. And then you have light age of enlightenment, scientific revolution, industrial, which then moved more and more into the material era. You know, I'm a baby boomer. I live through this market economy, which is great. It's great. I live through the hippie era. I lived through the yuppie era, and I definitely lived through the greedy era, which caused this sustainability challenge, which we all know. Because Adam Smith was right, the invisible hand will fix us. But he talked about the theory of moral sentiment, why freedom can be done. Because he says human beings are inherently altruistic that the enlightened self-interest will prevail over the self-interest <clears throat> of greed. And the invisible hand says, uh-uh, I give you sustainability challenge, so you have to evolve this direction towards enlightenment and awakening. And what's enlightenment? Just awakening. You start realizing. Enlightenment is a process of awakening to finding congruency. And move from you against me, like most business school teach, competitive strategy, to I to we. The first is, at least you know I and we. I, then you realize I in we, because we don't exist. Then finally, you move into love state. I am we. How many feels your family is you? That they suffer, you suffer. I am we. Now, can we solve the environmental problem? No, it's getting further and further. You know, I'm just saying, forget it. I don't know about future, but the first stage, 2030, is further away. Why? We don't care. We talk about it. We do this. Oh, government, we blame. Oh, government has more action. You have business have to do more. Me, I'm just a little guy. You know, what can I do? Why? Singapore? You only see chicken in a supermarket. Your nature, or our nature, is botanic garden. We are so away from nature. How do we connect with nature? Connectivity is love. Without love, how do you care? You don't really care. Do you? We have to ask ourselves. Do we really care living in this human construct world into illusion. Mm -hmm. okay. So we cannot solve the problem. I ask one question. I'm moving towards vegan, I'm promoting plant-based. I never could believe I can be plant-based. But it's really quite good after you get used to it. And in fact, after being plant-based, I can't smoke or drink because the body becomes clean and feel much better. If everybody become vegan, we already reached 2030. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So I don't, yeah, you finish it. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I have a burning question for you, but finish it. Yes. Is there one thing we can do for our own health and the health of the dearth? Okay. So don't say we cannot do anything. You can help the formula. Just become the direction. And it's 
doesn't have to be tomorrow. Plant-based begin with 15% meat and 85% vegetable. And I guarantee you, you'll love it. And as you move more, okay, your body needs time too. With the batteries, the, 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 the microbiome's different. So you need to watch it. You also need to be intelligent to eat well. And not this temple, you know, vegan food that my mother eats. It's new wellness, delicious, tasting manual, fantastic. And the flavor is a lot more than meat, I can tell you that. If a chance, come to my office. I have a vegan restaurant for my staff to learn how to eat. Back to here. If we all become vegan, that 2030 balance of carbon. Well, let people have technology, let government put in more mileage. And then we have the whole different thinking, right? I just recently joined, not recently, you know, there's a, Thomas says, there's a government activity. He created a quasi-government trust to take leadership because Singapore is like China. Big business is them, big nonprofit is them, big government is them. Of course, China is much more than Singapore, much better control. Okay. So, I tell you, we can all promote love. Recently, I was in Bloomberg. Now, I have a number of nonprofits doing different things. One is Restore Nature, number 17. But the most loved one I told when the PAA launched, and then the uh, Action Committee, they have people on there talking. Okay. I said, if our heart is not green, there will be greenwashing. If we can change our mind, everything change. Change yourself and all your relationship will change. And we can do it together. It's difficult, as Andrea say, in the material era of the fear, self-interest, and ignorance, that we're not this limited, we're all creative. We can put a pile of soil and then create the android of human. We can create chicken meat without chicken. Human beings are so creative. I'm totally convinced we can solve it if we use a different motivation. And if you look, all the wise people in the world, they always say, choose love, not fear. So recently I was in Bloomberg CEO meeting. <clears throat> And gave the speech of CEO of love and dividend, uh, and dividend of joy. And everybody knows you experience it when you give love. There's joy coming back. So long time talk about triple bottom line, triple bottom line. Let's look about our impact, what's into us. If you invest money in the right way, take a long-term view, you get dividend of material called money. But then you get an immediate return called dividend of joy using an entire different motivation called love. Now, family business like ours, we can have more control because family business is Hotel California. Once you check in, you can have a leave. So we can take our time long term because we're stuck. <laughs> And we choose that way, we can do it. Think about a CEO from a company. Like, really good, I love you, but I sell all your shares. Or I can't read of you. It's impossible for them, even they used to have love. But us, we're humans. And family is about love. Without love, the family can't stay together. So why can't we make the love bigger? And besides, we can't leave the penny business. So that's why I'm, I'm chairing the Council of Wisdom for the Family Business Network. Moving from talking to action, creating our own impact hub. Doing the same thing in Singapore, Hong Kong, and China. This is an era for us in Asia. Economics moving here for sure. Globalization is happening either way. It was a Western globalization through ruling and colonialism. You see China's moving back up with one world, one belt. It's doing the same globalization with influence and diversity the U.S. into another 150 countries. It is non-stop Dao, evolution energy. God, the will of God, it's all true. Different names. 
Just like we call about this new economy, it's coming. And this new economy will be driven by different purpose. So therefore, I believe impact investment, ESG, will gain momentum. And the good economy, top down from China, will also do great leadership. And now the pendulum changed from the west to the east. And now the east to the west, doing the same globalization evolutionary process. And here in Singapore, the crossroad of east and west. That's why we are flourishing. Great government, great people, great time. Singapore does not belong to just Singaporean. I had a one time talk. Singapore is very small. They can never be big. But they aspire to be great. Singapore is a platform. Singapore, it belongs to those who believe and stay in Singapore. And soon, if we can get more land from Malaysia, Singapore will be 20 million. Uh-huh. And Johor will be leased to Singapore for 100 years. German Sao, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I All think, right. ah, yes, I think. I should stop. Uh, yeah. I got the message. Thank you. Big hand. Thank you is it uplifting yeah, or not? Yeah, I think so. I Wow. Vegan. <laughs> Love, yes, pr- pretty uplifting. Okay, but <laughs> perhaps to we'll a little bit <laughs> stretching, but that's you know. Let's say you smoke on marijuana just now. <laughs> so definitely kept us all awake after lunch. Um, we are we are doing Q and A now, but actually, you know, while you all figure out your questions, I must let Andreas have the first yes, question. Yes, His first burning question. question. Well, I just you know was thinking as you were speaking, Fred. This, We've just presented a very practical view of sustainability and a, and a spiritual view of sustainability. And it's interesting that you know China is sitting right in between these two, where it absolutely wants economic growth. I'm going to ask you about China because he's he's quite a China expert. He spends 40 percent of his time there. And but I'm not but, a panda hugger, okay? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but you know they also want sustainable growth, common prosperity and, uh, you know, prevent kids from overusing technology, tackle greedy pharma companies, reduce stress from private tutoring, um, allow slower growth in some in order to have more sustainable growth. Um, Do you think that China is striking the right balance between kind of um, practical economic growth and spiritual societal sustainability? And do you think the government has the support of the people on that particular aspect? Well, first of all, I don't know. But I can tell you what they're doing. China is very important, a big country, into their plans, very important into what they say. So everything's very transparent. So up to Xi Jinping, it's based on the philosophy of GDP. They say, development is so development is about hard truth. Everything you listen to what he say is not. He says, um, Well, we are going... Culture. In other words, culture is economy. Now, build a culture and you get a new economy. It's not focusing on economy like, oh, I don't produce. And if you look at the Chinese index, industrial production... Services. Do, 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 do. You can see even the economic. He's driving economy by culture so that we can get out of this manipulative, greedy market economy. They call Chinese characteristic socialistic market economy. And what is Chinese characteristic? In his definition, I have to speak in Chinese, but very difficult to translate, but we have translated there. Yeah, we do. To create a community of a shared destiny. You know, rebuild the glory of Russia is because we know we are the same destiny. The I in we, as I mentioned. We therefore we have just a culture of worldview. And what is this culture? A worldview? Tian Chinese, um, ultimate aspiration, 
unification with the all cosmos. In other words, you're driven in a deeper connection. Okay. A harmonious, harmonizing nation. In other words, a better united nation. Okay? It's social diversity, harmony, and a mind or human that is trots goodness. In this case, it's true good and beauty. And there's a whole new, a whole structure in Chinese of great learnings on that to build this market economy and to have full confidence, especially the confidence with yourself, your culture, your system. And to create our own road, our own system. China is now growing and create ourselves and return the essence of being Chinese. Jane Chinese is not a location. Chinese is Han culture. I hope that that's explained. <laughs> so therefore, everything they do is in line with this. So every day you talk about is culture. Okay. Okay, I hope that kind of answered your question. Sure. <laughs> um, I'll open the floor to questions. Um, there are mics or um, there's pigeonhole. Oh, okay. I've, I'll, I'll read out the question. We've got one from uh, pigeonhole. Okay. Um, is it more challenging, in your view, as leaders and stewards of long-established global businesses to transform your strategy and operations compared to startups? So maybe, uh, Andreas, you could go first, transforming your strategy compared to a startup. So I think the accepted wisdom is it's quite difficult to take a legacy business with lots of processes and people who know how things are done a certain way and to be disruptive and, and do new things. We have 18 companies in our group and a lot of them are very well established companies. Nine of them are publicly listed companies on the stock exchange. But we also have a lot of young companies and startups, um, mostly in these transition businesses like solar, wind, biofuels, and batteries that Sushan mentioned earlier. And the way that we do this is we identify good businesses with good leaders, and then we invest in them, and we give them this kind of wrap or support, if you will. And it's a very kind of carefully calibrated wrap, because if you wrap too tightly, you actually strangle the enthusiasm and the uh, entrepreneurialism, but young businesses need that kind of support. If it's done right, I actually think that legacy businesses can really catapult these young businesses into another league. We've seen this, you know, I'll, I'll give you a practical example. We have a small water business, it's growing very fast, but it's still small. And, you know, we were looking for a new senior leader and we go to someone who uh, has been 30 years in one of the industry leaders. And his comment to us was, I wouldn't even be talking to you as a water company because you're so small and non-established. But when I see the group behind, and by the way, I've dealt with other parts of the group and I have such a good impression of the culture and so on. So absolutely, I'm happy to have that conversation. That's where the group can really sort of help. So I guess the answer is we're trying to do both. Okay. You know. Chairman Zhang. Well, you know, what I can learn from my <clears throat> previous uh, ancestor is you always serve the era. My great-grandfather served China trade. My great-grandfather. My grandfather started serving Japan industrialization. My father started serving Asian industrialization. I do Asian industrialization, supply chain, and now the new era. So I have a company called Octave, who started 15 years ago. Its mission is to create a new era. So it's a continuum. We are evolving. Think about it. We are always evolving. If you evolve, you can sustain. Mm -hmm. So the minute you say, I need to trans transcend, it's difficult. So I've moved from many things. So during the, the thing, that, oh, Fred, you're not going to own many ships, you're going asset line. But we actually employ more people because we're turning into a service and a trading company. 
So you would know what to do. And now, you know, we're transiting to work from home, you know, and they create an office club. Okay. So, you know, you're constantly moving. And as long as your mind is thinking like that, how do you eat an elephant? Don't worry too much. Invite your friends. Steal one bite at a time. And don't eat too much. Don't be greedy. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions from the floor? Ah, yes. Uh, the mic, please. Hi, I'm Rosalind from The Straits Times. I wanted to ask, what is your advice for CEOs who are trying to start on their sustainability journey for their companies? For example, while mitigating energy risk, what are some things that they should look out for? Um, so I, I, I guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I actually pick up on what Fred just said, which is, and I, I had exactly this thought, which is don't try to eat the elephant. This is a very big topic. Um, start by identifying what are your main sources of environmental impact um, and then take small steps to tackle them. So that's obviously going to be different for every company and every industry. Um, but I'm such a believer, actually, Fred started his remarks with this, the, the distance we can go with incremental kind of improvements is just incredible. You know, you may have taken from my earlier remarks, oh, you know, it's so hard and they're not going to make it. The, the point I want to stress is I'm super optimistic on a 20, 30, 50 year horizon about our ability to do things. I'm just saying, let's be realistic about what we can achieve in the next five or 10 years. Um, we're not sitting on our hands, so I'll give you some examples of what we're doing. Um, we're buying new dual fuel ships. We're retrofitting old ones to run on clean fuels. We pioneered the development of um, LPG engines for ships. We're investing in energy saving devices. We're using AI and technology to do smart navigation and predictive maintenance to reduce emissions. We're investing in these businesses, solar, wind, and, and batteries, and so on. We founded the Global Center for Decarbonization. So there are so many things we can do. It still doesn't add up, by the way, to 30% reduction in emissions by 2030, but it's going to get us to some amazing outcomes if we can break it down and do lots of small things. Okay. And Chairman Shao? Yeah, well, uh -huh. they have a lot of parties. Join the community because you need journey mates. You need mutual learning. You need people to have support you. You need to have traveling. You need companion. That's what we do, throwing a lot of parties. The next one, 13 of October, IMC Impact Hub. When you have a lot of people, you have party, you talk, you connect, you share, you feel confident. It's not an easy journey of changing yourself and changing the world. You have doubts. You feel tired. You seem like alone. You can't even get your team to think like you because they don't know what's wrong with you. So CEO is very difficult to become CEO of love. <laughs> so first one, get them together. If you don't drink for happiness, drink for sadness, but drink together. <laughs> All right, so that's our number one. Number two, bring philanthropy to the corporation. The solution, that the root we know is a greedy market economy. Well, the solution we all know is love. Love. So bring philanthropy. When I joined uh, uh, PAA, they keep thinking of your family trust. No, no, it's my business trust. And no matter, he's still family trust because it's counterintuitive. We need to bring love back into the company. Well, they don't know how to deal with it. They only think about philanthropy as an institution. Then bring philanthropy institution into the company and gradually engage them. Thank you. Okay. Party, party. <laughs> Remember that, students. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? I've got a couple, so I'll, I'll just go ahead. I mean, sustainability journey, very, I think it's tough. I think you're showing the way, the philosophy. Um, I think Andreas is also... Don't tell yourself it's tough because we create a mindset of tough. Ah. Let's say, let's have some fun, man. There's <laughs> opportunity to create. We're built to create. No, but can I jump in there? I mean, I think 
yes, mindset is important, but let's not kid ourselves that it's going to be super easy either. There is a middle path, which is, you know, Winston Churchill, blood, sweat and tears. This is going to be tough, but we can do it. And, you know, it's not, oh, it's all doom and gloom, we can't do it, it's so hard. It's kind of like, let's be realistic, this is going to be hard work and it's going to take sacrifice. And our standard of living is going to go down. People show me this photograph of New York in 1902, I think it was, or something, right? And it's all horses. And they say to me, this is New York in 1902, all horses. Look at a photograph of New York City in 1911. And you can't see a horse. There's actually one horse in the photograph, but you almost can't see it. It's all cars. And they say, you know what? When you hit a tipping point, it's going to go so fast, you won't believe what's hit you. Just like New York shifting from horses to cars. The untruth in that statement is that going from a horse to a car is a massive upgrade. You know, the, car, the horses were dumping manure on the streets. People had to shovel it away. Uh, they were slow. It was inefficient. And it was a huge upgrade going to a car, and it happened very fast. Going from oil to ammonia and hydrogen and methanol is a massive downgrade. It's far less energy intensive. It's more toxic. It's harder to produce. It costs three times as much. Who are we kidding? I mean, we should tell people this is going to be hard. It's going to cost more, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. So I, I have to emphasize mindset. I agree with you, Fred. Mindset has to be positive, but let's be honest with people. True. That's why I run the program that I train <laughs> all my staff at eight day, seven night <laughs> retreat, changing out. It's very challenging, you know, but mostly it's very painful. And we teach people to shift mindset about relationship with pain. Anyway... Uh, at the you moment. had a question. I interrupted. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. We interrupted your question. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it will be open to public soon. No, uh, are you, will you be inviting Andreas to your retreat? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Then uh, uh, we can uh, debate after the program. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe I just wanted to ask a bit about geopolitics. It's, it's been one of the themes of, of, of the summit. How will geopolitics affect our sustainability journey? Does it have any impact? No. No. Okay. All right. Okay, that was, you know, <laughs> Andreas. So, I think you can look at it two ways, and, you know, both have merit, so I'm not going to come down heavily on one. one. One argument is, if you have supply chains being cut and broken, the world is going to become less efficient, um, if China can't get access to top semiconductor chips from you know, other parts of the world or, or equipment, that's going to slow down their progress. They're, they're driving the green economy, but you basically say you can't have this, you can't have that, that's going to slow them down. Um, and maybe that's my sort of feeling, which is in the near term, once the world stops being this super efficient global trading system, things will slow down. And especially once you get tit for tat, because then it's very easy for them to say, well, actually, you need my germanium to produce your chips, so I'm going to stop selling you germanium, and everything slows down. The counter-argument is actually throughout history, competition between nations has fueled incredible human progress. Whether that was the arms race or the space race or lots of these competitive geopolitical clashes in the past, and the worst case being war, of course, has led to phenomenal human progress because suddenly the fire is lit and people really want to progress. So maybe that's my kind of hedged answer, which is maybe slower in the near term, but you know, maybe we'll do better with more competition in the long run. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got one question. We're, we're coming towards the end of our session, so I think it might be about time to, to wrap up, unless there are any other questions. Um, okay, so perhaps here we, we've got this question in the spirit of sustainability. Um, you know, one day, if you had one last breath, what would you say to the next generation leader taking over your role? Uh, we'll let Andreas go first, <laughs> and and Chairman Shao can have the last word. To the next generation leader. 
So I would say um, focus on doing the best you can within the confines of your sphere of control, which for instance, if it's a company, focus on optimizing the performance of your company because this is the best way to ensure sustainability for the company and um, also human progress because that's how markets function. But keep an eye on the bigger human picture because if you lose sight of why you're doing what you're doing or you become disconnected from human needs or planetary needs, um, that is very dangerous. Mm. Okay, Chairman. Well, I'm older, so I already told them <laughs> before my last breath. Is the conclusion we have a mandate, we have a manifesto, I'm now writing a lot of books. Most important is live a life that you can add value to life itself, including yourself. A life meaningfully lived. We are beyond survival of food and all that. And if you choose to be protector of these resources that we leave behind, which you serve this add value to life, it's great. If not, go on. My younger son asked me, Dad, how can I succeed where you don't? Well, that's why you succeed me to complete what I started. It will take generation. This is family business. Mm. Take a long-term view and add value to life. So I already said all that to them. <laughs> Maybe last breath is, remember, <laughs> add value to life. <laughs> okay, I think on that note, uh, <laughs> I don't think we can better that. So thank you very much for your time, Andreas and Chairman Shao. Thank you, audience, for your questions and, and your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea.